Please welcome to the stage, the Renewing Citizen Trust in Democratic Institutions and Governance Panel. Hello, everybody. Oh, good. You can hear me. Um, good afternoon. I am Don Nakagawa from the Bergruen Institute, and I have with me um, Eli and Yael. You have their names. Eli has actually spent a few years creating um, safe public spaces online, and he was the uh, author uh, who first coined the term filter bubble, so I'm very honored to have him here, and he's a good friend. Yael has worked for Facebook on the Election Integrity Project. She also is formerly CIA. Um, and currently a Bergruen Fellow, so full disclosure. And we also have Irene Khan uh, with us virtually. She is the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression for the UN. So we're going to talk about democracy, and I had to follow a preacher, so please forgive me. I know hopefully your energy is all up and you're all awake because he had this rousing tone to him. I'll try to, I'll try to mimic that a little bit. Um, so democracy is in crisis. That's file that under news to nobody. Um, in some ways, I think democracy is always in crisis, right? It's an evolving project of trying to coordinate and find compromise uh, among multiple dissatisfactions. And so there's always polarization. We have fake news. That's not new either. We even have had political violence in the, in the past, and we've seen some of that recently. So none of it's new. But to accept that as sort of a reality and a norm, I think, puts us at a disadvantage of seeing what the problem is now and what's changed. And clearly what has changed is the fourth estate. Our information ecosystem is very, very different than it used to be. One where the narratives were controlled and the flow of information was controlled, um, provided a certain kind of stability for representative democracy that we no longer have. And there are good and bad things about that. Giving people more voice and more choice, which is what technology has done, is not all bad. But there are definitely negative downside consequences to it. And so I want to spend a little time today talking about how do we re sort of invigorate our democracy and re-legitimize it, find new ways to have, to practice democracy that, uh, that people can find trust in. But we're going to start with what's broken about the um, social media and media ecosystem. So Irene, I wanted to talk to you first um, and ask you, you know, what is it about the current system, the current media environment that we're living in that is so destabilizing to democracy? Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this um, panel, uh, a very uh, topical, on a very topical issue. Uh, let me start by saying that it's a perfect storm a perfect storm in which technology, political factors, economic grievances, and certain pressures on media freedom have come together. Technology has now made it possible to share texts, images, videos, deep fakes, shallow fakes that distort uh, reality. And that false information is then amplified by algorithms and by the business models of social media uh, platforms. Uh, that are designed to uh, attract people and keep them attracted uh, with sensational content. And this online environment encourages on the one hand amplification and on the other hand reduces the accessibility to diverse sources of information. So you're getting driven down a certain path into false news. At the same time, media, legacy media is under pressure, uh, both uh, in terms of its business interests, its economic model, but also under pressure, political pressure in many parts of the world because of authoritarian trends. And, and that combined that of those authoritarian trends, pressure on media and digital technology with real life grievances that a lot of people have who feel left behind, who feel disenfranchised um, and growing and, and, and under pressure from growing inequalities. When you put all those factors together, you can understand why people no longer know what is true. What and democracy is built on shared understanding of truth uh, and facts. And facts are being distorted, truth uh, no longer exists, and that is creating a huge problem for democracy and of course media's failure, both social media and legacy media's failure to rise to those challenges and to feed that sense of uh, falsehood. 
I, I think that's 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 the crisis Thank we're you. facing today. Thank you, Irene. Um, Yael, I wanted to turn to you, and because you've spent a lot of time publicly um, and privately in conversation with me, um, talking about what accountability the platforms have for the situation that we're working in right now and operating in. Um, so I wanted to ask you to reflect on that, because obviously the big platforms have an enormous amount of power in this, and the incentives and the system itself create certain kinds of behaviors and outcomes. Yet, they're not alone, and right? There's a cacophony of voices, and there's many, many different players in this space. And as Irene just pointed out, it's also a failure of traditional media. So what accountability do you think the platforms have, and how much can they change the current instability in the system? Sure, so you know, I'm gonna start with, I'm hoping we're all at a point where we can all agree about the fact that the current situation cannot remain the status quo, so I'm not gonna give my whole speech about why that is. So moving from there forward, um, you know, I, I'm not one of those people who says that social media is the only thing that is wrong with our democracy, but when you have companies, Facebook especially, who did their, their goal was to intentionally scale to dominate the global form of communication. This was not an accident, this was their intention. So with that comes the responsibility of how to govern those public spaces. And, and I think the fundamental problem is so much of this conversation has been about either content moderation, what do we keep up, what do we take down, about what to do about hate speech, about what to do about things we disagree with. And all of those things, while incredibly important, they're all sort of tinkering around the margins of the fundamental idea that you have private, well, not private, they're publicly traded, but private companies whose only real responsibility, except for in cases of federal law, are to protect their shareholder profit, their fiduciary responsibility, and yet they're governing public spaces. And so, you know, just one short example, when I was there, one of the things I really tried to do was, was I was in charge of sort of this new, in 2018, what are we gonna do about political advertising after Cambridge Analytica? And the two very basic questions I asked were, well, shouldn't we be fact-checking political ads if we're going to actually take money for them and give them our targeting tools to target different audiences with this speech? And I was shut down for that, and then trying to build in a voter suppression plan, both of those reasons were the reasons I was pushed out. And now the Wall Street Journal series this week really shows that all of the employees within these companies who are trying to figure out how do we fix this, how do we fix this, are bumping up against the fact that in order to fix it, you would have to fundamentally change the entire way these platforms make their money, and that's off the table. So just in sum, I do think that there, we have to figure out how to build an accountability, not for the speech that is being spread on the platforms, but for the tools and the business decisions that these platforms are giving and selling, designing, monetizing for how to amplify and recommend this speech. And if they're not willing to take on that responsibility, which has demonstrated they're not, then we, the public, have to figure out how do we get our public spaces back let Instagram be for videos of cats, but how do we get our public debate back? Great, that's awesome. That's a great segue to Eli. Because um, Eli, you're working on this, right? You're working on what does it mean to create a public space online that is safe, that is healthy, where constructive dialogue can take place, um, and hopefully where democracy can thrive. So what have you learned in the process of studying this space? Well. Um you know, to, to pick up where Yale left off, I think the, the first piece is like, we have to diagnose the problem right. And I do think there's a limit to what we can do inside, you know, private VC-backed structures. Um, they're just not designed to do a bunch of the public functions that we need. And one of the metaphors that we find really useful at New Public, which is kind of the, the group of people that um, I'm, I'm helping coordinate that uh, is building better public spaces, um, is, is kind of making reference to offline space. So when we think about how are communities organized, how are offline spaces organized, and cities especially, where you have a lot of the same growth and stranger and other kind of coordination problems, um, you know, we see you know, there, there are definitely, you know, private enterprise has this really important role to play, but you also have these genuinely public spaces that are built in a really different way and serve different purposes. And these are institutions that um, 
actually, you know, were developed, if you think about parks or you think about libraries, they were developed in times of similar like social stress and stress and fragmentation and the introduction of new technologies as a way of helping build spaces where we come together. So I would say, you know, there's lots of learnings that we have underneath that, but the but the keystone is that if we want to have healthy public fora, we need to invest in them separate from you know, sort of reforming the private institutions that we have. And that reform task is important, but if we don't start actually building institutions that serve these social tasks as their fundamental mandate, we're not gonna get there. And I'll just, you know, the one example I think about is a library. Um, if you think about libraries in, as an institution, um, you know, a library, if you start to translate that into something that's VC-backed, if you say like, okay, my library is gonna take VC money, you start taking away all of the social value very quickly because what makes a library special is exactly that it is um, trying to serve a lot of people who have very little sort of you know, marginal return on uh, investment from a financial perspective. And so um, I think we need more institutions like that. And that's what we're working on building. So the, so my sense is that yes, that's the, that's the direction we need to move in, right? It can't just be about trying to manage the negative externalities of the system as we have it now, that's not gonna actually be enough. That we actually have to create um, safe digital public spaces because we can't actually fix the crisis of democracy without having some of those available to us. We need to use that set of tools. And then there are a whole other set of things that we need to do around, I think, reinventing democracy, which, which I'll get into in a minute. But before I go there, to date, we've kind of known about this issue. It kind of broke into the public consciousness around 2016. It gained a lot of momentum. An enormous amount of activity has happened in the space, both uh, you know, academics and policymakers, and even the platforms have tried some things. But it, generally, the government response has been somewhat anemic when you think about it, right? We're five, six years into this crisis, and there's a couple of pieces of legislation from different corners of the world that have been passed that have been meaningful, but we really haven't got our heads around the problem and managed this. So Irene, I wanted to ask you, what, what is your sense of why the response from regulators and the government has been so far so anemic to protect itself? Well, I think because as um, Eli alluded to, I think we're missing uh, the real issue here. Uh, we're talking about right to freedom of expression. We're talking about democracy, about human rights. And yet there is very little of that in the policy sphere. We have two types, two groups of governments, I would say. There's one category that is interested in suppressing human rights and reducing the space that technology has created for us to share information and um, to generate debate. And then there are there is another set of government that, that want to do nothing to restrict uh, social media, the negative uh, impact of social media for fear of uh, trampling on innovation or for economic reasons or for other reasons. What is missing is an understanding that smart regulation based on human rights is what governments need to do. Uh, we see some elements of that perhaps in the European uh, digital uh, regulations that are coming in, but what needs to be done is not for governments not to interfere with content moderation, but for governments to use international human rights standards to enforce data protection. Number one, to ensure transparency of uh, the digital platforms uh, so that the users know what is happening and can feel empowered. And, and thirdly, is to make sure that the platforms themselves are living up to international human rights standards because they are, this is public space that we are talking about. And therefore, what is global, what are the global standards for managing public space? That's what we call uh, human rights standards. So I think that needs to focus needs to go back uh, to, to that base concept of protecting human rights, the right to freedom of expression for all without um, you know, restricting a censorship or, or creating ne negative impact on democracy. Thank you, Irene. So I wanted to give you two both a chance to respond to that. Like, what is it do you think that's preventing government from acting more proactively and more assertively in this space? And I'm sure Yael has an opinion about this. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, I've written extensively, and I won't talk now about some of the ways I do think we should be considering legislation. 100% agree with Irene. I think we get really bogged down when we even start to consider that government should get involved with content moderation. I, that that's just a non-starter. 
but I'm going to give lawmakers a little bit of, of leeway here in saying that in a weird way, they're also the product of this information ecosystem we have right now. I, I'm going to say something that some of my colleagues aren't going to love, but those of us who work in this space are also, every time a lawmaker tries to do anything in this space, even a simple, seemingly simple piece of legislation to protect political advertising and making it more transparent online, you know, legislation that exists in the offline world. There is such a sea of anger and screaming about how every single possible legislative fix is going to destroy the entire internet that we're not actually helping come together as those of us who want to create a healthier public sphere and really helping our lawmakers think through kind of first principles, right? What is it that we want and what are some of the ways we can get there? And so I actually, I mean, I don't know how lawmakers can really tackle this as long as there's a lot of money in one side of trying to make sure lawmakers don't touch the internet. We know that. But even those who are really concerned about this are, you know, you hear, oh, antitrust isn't the answer. Section 230 isn't the answer. Data privacy isn't the answer. You know what? They are all part of the answer. Um, so I, that, I'm not giving my exact legislative fix, but also government, you know, government has to rebuild trust too. And so this idea of transparency, it goes all around, right? Government needs to be very transparent about why they're trying to figure out what to do about the media and social media landscape. And they also, I believe, need to legislate transparency around how these platforms are using our data and how they're actually monetizing the information that has become our public sphere. Yeah, if I can, if I can just add to that. Uh, we were talking before the panel about um, you know, uh, a paper that came out recently that was sort of comparing uh, you know, the social media, understanding social media to, to the climate change discourse. And that you know, for a long time, climate change kind of lingered in this space of, well, we don't really know enough, and there's these unintended consequences to various interventions, and what are we going to do about that? And there's been this recent call to kind of turn it into a, a crisis discipline, which says like, okay, we're going to make some mistakes, but we've got to do something because there's a crisis. And I think that's kind of where we are uh, now with our, our digital public sphere. Um, but I would also say, there's an element of kind of public imagination that's missing that I would love to see us reclaim. So, you know, Elon Musk can uh, have any crazy idea that he wants in public, and everybody's like, okay, great, let's go to Mars with robots. Um, but when you talk about standing up new kinds of institutions that do support a, a more thoughtful digital democracy, there's this idea of, well, that's really too hard. That would cost billions of dollars. How are we going to do that? And I think we just kind of have to get over that and recognize that having kind of some, some imagination about what the internet could look like if it wasn't just built by um, VCs, uh, that's, what's, that's what we're called to right now. And so to me, that's the exciting part of what's ahead. So I'd like, to, we're, I'm gonna close out here because we've got a minute 30 left. Um, but that, I mean, that's exactly what I think we need to do. So we, Burgoon Institute released a report last year called Renewing Democracy for the Digital Age. And it really pointed the finger at policymakers, not because they're not regulating enough, although that's part of the problem, but we need to reimagine our democracy. Democracy is not one person, one vote. It is democracy formed by the people. And we now have incredibly powerful tools for doing democracy in brand new ways. And there's an enormous amount of innovation that's happening in the system. So going back to what you were saying, Eli, about what happens offline, right? What happens in these offline spaces? We can create entirely new kinds of online and offline spaces, citizens' engagement that's both broad and deep, and do it with tremendous transparency. It feels like it is the genie's never going back in the bottle. We are never going to have an, a media ecosystem as it was, and that was built for a stable representative democracy, but we don't have that anymore. So unless we reinvent our institutions and do democracy in a different way, I think it's gonna be very difficult for us to, um, you know, sort of um, capture citizens' trust again without engaging them very deeply. So I want to thank my panelists, Eli, Yael, and Irene. Um, Irene, thank you for coming in from wherever you are and being with us today. Um, and that concludes our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.